Hi, so welcome to this episode of History Hunters. Our story for this episode starts right here on March 24th, 1906 at what was the Southern Pacific Railroad Station. Now the station that is behind me has a replacement to the one that we're going to be focusing on, the one that was here back in 1906. It was the subject of a huge crime story here in Stockton, California. It was here that a 30-year-old woman by the name of Emma Ledoux dropped by here. She had a trunk delivered here. It was quite heavy. It was about 225 pounds. She wanted to have it shipped to the Tuolumne County area. However, she didn't put a tag on it and it remained on the loading dock. That trunk looked a little suspicious. It was there on the dock for a couple of hours until 10 o'clock at night. Somebody noticed it and uh, tried to pick it up. They were immediately suspicious about what was inside, so they contacted the Stockton Police Department, got a warrant to open it, and to their surprise, they found a human body stuffed inside. It was that of Albert McVicker, who was the estranged husband of Emma Ledoux. That trunk, that story, or huge news in Stockton, California. And it's that story that I'm going to talk to you about on this episode of History Hunters. So having researched this story for the last couple of months, I am uh, kind of in awe of the fact that I'm here at this Amtrak station. It's where this body was discovered way back in 1906. It was the Southern Pacific Railroad. Uh, I have postcard pictures of it to show you what it looks like. Vastly different from this one. The old depot was torn down. This one was put in its place in 1930. It's now an Amtrak station. And uh, as you know, we don't use trains hardly as much as we used to, but this was an important hub for Stockton back in the day. So many people that came in, in and out on the trains, right in this same footprint as where the Southern Pacific Station was. Ledoux had locked a steamer trunk, delivered it here to be put on a train, but she neglected to place a shipping label on it, and it became unattended for several hours until personnel were puzzled as to what to do with it. It weighed about 225 pounds. 10 o'clock at night, they noticed it, they tried to pick it up. Just who was Emma Ledoux? She was the first woman sentenced to death in California after she was convicted of murder, but she wasn't executed. She was born as Emma Teresa Cole on September 10, 1875 in Pine Grove in Amador County. Emma was married five times in her life and two of her husbands met with suspicious endings. In 1892 or 1893, when she was 16, she married her first husband, Charles Barrett, but they were divorced in 1898. Next, she married William Williams, who died in 1902 under suspicious circumstances in Cochise County, Arizona. Nitric acid poisoning was suspected in his death. Emma just happened to be the beneficiary of Williams' life insurance policy and was paid $2,000 upon his death. But the victim in this story was husband number three, Albert McVicker, whom she married three months after William's death. McVicker was reportedly enamored with his wife, but the feeling wasn't mutual and they separated. Records indicate that the couple never got divorced, yet she was married again, this time in August 1905 to Eugene Ledoux, who lived in Sutter Creek. She apparently never mentioned to her new husband that she was still married to Albert McVicker, and thus she was a bigamist. Emma was known to wander away for weeks at a time from Ledoux, favoring visits to San Francisco and Stockton. It was suggested in court that she was known to be a prostitute and she enjoyed swindling people out of money. Well, Emma had purchased a trunk at the Rosenbaum store at Main and Sutter Streets in Stockton and she had it delivered to her apartment. And she asked the delivery man to wait about an hour until she packed it full for him to pick up and deliver here. She got here with another man. She was in a panic because the trunk wasn't here. When it finally showed up, it said that she and the man took the rope and she tied the trunk up and um, they wanted to make sure that that trunk was not going to pop open at all. So just to show you how things have changed since 1906, this is Minor Avenue. It was the surface street and uh, they made this an underground passageway. So now the car traffic goes underneath, but back back in 1906 
this would have been at grade level. Now I do have to point out that back in those days, newspapers were known to, uh, well, shall we say, invent some of the stories that they printed. Um, it was yellow journalism, so it was all sensationalism. One of the facts that keeps getting repeated is that the uh, authorities were alerted by the stench coming from the trunk. And most experts today believe that you know, if a body had been in a truck for a day, there, there wouldn't have been any odor coming from it. So that was another whopper that they told in the newspapers. They just made up a lot of stuff along the way and went with rumor and innuendo and they didn't necessarily employ facts when they were reporting stories. And that particularly is true of the Stockton Record and the Stockton Evening Mail back then. One of the things that the newspaper got wrong was a headline that screamed A.N. McVicker slugged to death, his body thrust into trunk. But the blood actually streamed from his nose, which was either broken or had been smashed against the wall of the trunk. Later authorities determined that McVicker had been poisoned, not beaten to death. Something I thought was pretty interesting is, even though this is a newer building, the depot was here, but these houses over here undoubtedly were the ones that were here back in 1906. And you can tell them the architectural style is uh, of that period and they lined this entire street i don't know what street we got here but it's strange they've got surveillance cameras right here too that's another thing that has changed so much in our country you got surveillance cameras just about everywhere in this country it's because people do wrong all the time imagine if they had a surveillance camera for emma ledoux back in 1906 would have made their detective work a lot easier, even though the, the Stockton detectives were on that very fast. In fact, they had Emma Dew in custody in Antioch two days later. She had a lot of questions to answer. Okay, so I'm coming over to show you where the location of the Stockton jail was back when Emma Dew was incarcerated here. It's missing now, it's not here. So now I'm at the intersection of Channel and San Joaquin Streets, and I know that my viewers like me to do a lot of before and after comparisons, and this is exact location where the old Stockton Jail was when Sheriff Cunningham was here, and it was uh, where Emma Ledoux was behind bars from 1906 until 1910 when she was taken to San Quentin Prison. There was a woman's block there, but this trunk that we're going to go visit it was actually stored in the jail until the brick jail was raised in 1961. So a little bit of history that's been stolen from Stockton. It was a beautiful jail. In fact, I did a video on it in one of my earlier programs. You know, I wish in this country we would leave beautiful buildings like that old jail up. I mean, it was just a gorgeous structure and uh, it came down like a lot of brick buildings do. There's still some beautiful buildings around here. This one over here I'm gonna show you, uh, looks like it's from that period as well. Beautiful building. At least they didn't tear that one down. All right, so I've driven over here to California and Main Streets, and I'm very happy to report that the California house where Emma Ledoux killed Albert McVicker is still standing. It's that building right behind me. It was built in 1896 and it is no longer being inhabited by anything, but maybe ghosts of Mr. McVicker. It was in room 97 that his life ended. The incredible history in this building, and I believe it was on the third floor where this took place. Emma and Albert rented a room on March 11, 1906, which was 13 days before the murder. The next day they bought furniture just down the street, I understand, at a place called Brewers. I believe that's where they purchased this furniture from and they had it shipped to a location in Jamestown which is where Albert McVicker lived. Now apparently she got him here on the false pretenses that they were going to get back together again but that wasn't the case. She was actually planning to have him poisoned and murdered. Now they left here they went to San Francisco where she bought some morphine. Apparently she was an addict, according to her mom. And both were back on the train to Jamestown on March 15th. There McVicker quit his job at the Rawhide Mine outside of Jamestown on March 21st. And two days later they were back here in Stockton at this hotel. Now, 
Apparently, Emma and Albert were drinking flasks of whiskey the night of his death. Possibly it was her idea to get him very drunk and then poison him. In court, she would claim that a third man was drinking with them, to whom she would pin the poisoning on. And she claims that the third man was an accomplice named Joe Miller, and that he killed McVicker while she left the room for a couple of hours. She said that when she returned, she found McVicker murdered by Miller. She admitted stuffing Albert's body in the trunk, but denied poisoning him. Now, the police never believed that there was a Mr. Miller. Thought it was her convenient way of trying to pin the murder on somebody else. One of the telling aspects of her guilt was the fact that after this murder took place, she went down to the furniture store. She asked that the furniture could be delivered to a different location, which was the Ledoux residence outside of Sutter Creek. So it kind of makes her look complicit in this entire thing. So if she was innocent of committing the murder, why did she stuff him inside the trunk and attempt to send him to Jamestown? Well, the defense claims it was because she was scared of being fingered as the killer and tried to get rid of the body, hence the attempt to put the body and the trunk on the train. Now, after she committed the murder, or is believed to have committed the murder, she went and bought a trunk and she had it delivered to this location, room 97. She asked the delivery man if he could wait around an hour. She would have some things to pack, some dishes, some heavy dishes, she said. And then when he came back, it was very heavy, had it delivered to the train depot that we visited. And uh, it was there that her entire plot unraveled. Another outrageous statement printed in the Stockton newspapers described how Emma looked from a photo that police confiscated in her apartment, reporting that, quote, the chin was firm but too long and pointed to indicate a trustful or trustworthy disposition. Lots of street art here. But I gotta tell you, Kind of hard to say no to Jesus for mayor. I have come to the intersection of Weber and California streets because the newspapers reported that Emma Ledoux purchased her rope for the trunk in this location. And uh, I can't say for sure. It's possible that that apartment building over there had a ground floor of a commercial, maybe a shop. Beautiful buildings that are still here. This is definitely an older part of Stockton. But she came down here to buy the rope. She paid 25 cents for it, and the clerk at the time suggested that a woman who bought that amount of rope would probably be suspected of trying to commit suicide, and she laughed and went about her way, and that rope was used to tie the trunk to secure the body of Mr. Vic Vicker. That ugly day in Stockton. This caught my eye, erected by the Calaveras Society of San Joaquin County, 1915 to 1940. Well, this is probably the part of the video that you're all looking forward to. The actual trunk that Emma used to stuff her estranged husband's body in. <laughs> and it's got some blood stains. It's uh, kind of gross. Well, I walked up here and it's closed. <laughs> but they open at 1.30, so we're cool. Certainly has some loud geese around here. As I waited for the doors to open, I was greeted by Kelly Howard, a guard, who instantly recognized me because of my channel. I told him I was there to do a story on Ledoux and to see the trunk, and he took me there right away. Well, there it is, the infamous trunk. Okay, we're gonna look inside of this trunk with the light on. These are all stains. It's obviously where his his face was smashed down in here because this is where the majority of the blood is. And then it drips all the way there and it starts dripping down this way. I've heard different stories about how they uh, handled this. I heard one story where they said they were gonna, somebody it threw this off the baggage car because it didn't have a uh, any kind of a label but uh, I don't think they would be that careless in throwing a trunk off. I think she said that there were dishes in this that would account for the heaviness of this trunk, but uh, just the history here. Little Emma fastening this shut and latching this with her hands. It looks like, looks like there was some kind, I don't know, this is all original. This is metal. 
and uh, then she tied it up with some rope that she purchased. But yeah, this is a this is a very fascinating piece of criminal history here. I guess our society is just so fascinating with crime. We wonder how people can get the way they do, and then when they do commit crimes like this, we are fascinated to take a look at it and see what's going on with this person. Are they nuts? Well, I guess a lot of people know about it, right? And they want to come and see it? A lot of people hear about it. People come in and visit, they see it, they ask about it, they tell their friends, and they come down to see yeah. it. Yeah. A lot of people think it's gross. <laughs> Most see... people just macabre, you know, uh, yeah. fascinated by it, the, 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 maybe the paranormal. Some people think it might be like haunted or whatnot. Now, you said you've been in the hotel that we yes. just, that I just visited. Yes. Did you detect any kind of strange? We did. And there's, like actually, what? there's actually an episode coming out this October, you know, plug myself. It's got to be on YouTube? Yes, YouTube. Spirits of Downtown Stockton. Okay. And they're editing it right now. It's going to be out this October. Okay, so we have to wait and see yes. what you It'll saw. It'll be worth the wait. <laughs> okay. We actually went in there June 1st of last summer. And, uh, you know, I've been on the fence. I, I'm more of the host of the series. Yeah. And, you know, sometimes you, you feel something, sometimes you don't. That room was creepy from the time I walked oh, in. Oh, yeah. And it, it's... Well, it could uh, be, too, creepy, because you knew what happened in there. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yes, quite a story. Yeah. <laughs> you got a great museum here with a lot of historical photos on the wall. And How many actually come here just to see the trunk? Quite a few. I, yeah. Percentage-wise, you know, I don't know. We've got a great art collection upstairs. There's a lot to see here. Right. But we get people weekly that brought what brought them in was the trunk. Okay. But then they check out the museum. They're like, wow, they're just blown away. And I tell everybody, go tell your friends. Go tell your family. Tell everybody. What was the first thing you thought when you saw the trunk yourself? Uh, shock. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people now, the Faces the Forgotten guy was here a couple yes. of months ago, and he kept saying he didn't understand how that guy's body was stuffed inside that trunk. He, yes. he thought it was really small, but I, I don't know, it looks kind of bigger than well, the person. Well, figure was what, 5'10", 200 pounds? Yeah. And she had trouble getting him in there. So she had to... Hence the he smashed all, nose. Yes. He was all <laughs> bent up and not a normal... Oh, somebody who's alive would be comfortable. Right. But she got him in and shut it. And there was some debate as to whether or not he was dead when she stuffed him in there. He evidently wasn't dead. He might have been in a coma right. or whatever, unconscious, hopefully. Yeah. But looked, the fact that his nose was bleeding after they threw it off the truck uh, onto the railroad platform. Because if he had died, it wouldn't have bled like that. It wouldn't have bled. Yeah. And there were no Poor guy. stab wounds or, yes. I mean, you kind of feel sorry for him. It's like, Absolutely. What did he do? He thought they were getting back together. <laughs> you know, she was already married to Ledoux by then, but she was still legally married to McVeigh. Yeah. I think she had lured him to Stockton. She absolutely did. Well, she convinced him to quit his job at the mine, yeah. pull out his money, and they bought a bunch of furniture that were going to get back together and ship it to Jamestown to her parents. Right, farm. right. But as soon as he's dead, she goes down and changes the address to Ledoux's house. Yeah. I mean, and then she takes him to the railroad and says, ship to Jamestown. Yeah. She gets on a train and goes to San Francisco. Uh, kind of looks bad for her. He's a work. <laughs> <laughs> the trial of Emma Ledoux was postponed temporarily because of the April 1906 San Francisco earthquake. Her trial began on June 5th and lasted for three weeks, and she was convicted of first degree murder, becoming the first woman in California to receive a death sentence. She was sentenced to be hanged on October 19th at San Quentin Prison, but she received a stay of execution from the state Supreme Court. In 1910, she was granted a new trial, but she was in such bad health that she decided to plead guilty. She was sentenced to life imprisonment and spent 10 years in San Quentin before she was paroled in 1920. By then, Emma was 40 years old. After she was released, she violated parole when she supplied alcohol to underage boys and being drunk in public. After leaving San Quentin Prison, she married a Napa County rancher named Frederick A. Crackbond in 1925. He divorced her, and he died in 1929. She then worked as a nurse in Oakland to help support her 74-year-old mother. She also swindled lonely men out of their money through a pen pal Lonely Hearts Club. In the 1920s and 30s, she was going by the aliases of Grace Miller and Emma Crackbond and Grace Crackbond. In 1931, Emma was arrested for passing forged checks with a man named Albert Thompson. On April 21, 1931, she went to prison and in 1933 to the Tehachapi Institute for Women Prison for parole violations. 
There she died in 1941. So while I'm here, I'm just going to take a look at uh, some of the things that are here. This is as we came out, uh, unknown artist, circa 1870s, depicts a fire wagon, firefighters going somewhere. And this, a fire engine. Some of you may have seen the video I did on the firefighter who died in fighting the pavilion, the Ag Pavilion fire in Stockton many years ago. But <laughs> can you imagine fighting a fire with something like this? The buildings had no chance. This is a 1873 chemical wagon used to fight fires here in Stockton. Not only is this a historical museum, but it's it's an art gallery. And right here we've got some Alfred Bierstadt paintings. In fact, there's three of them here that I have noticed. This hung in the White House with President Ronald Reagan having it in the press briefing room. He was a German-born painter. Ronald uh, Reagan wanted uh, California represented in the White House uh -huh. while he was president. So it was probably the curator of the White House that arranged to borrow some paintings from out here. And he borrowed this one from us. Okay. This hung in the press room. Wow, it's a beautiful painting. Could be one of the original selfies because he painted himself into the painting. That's how oh. sketchy. Oh, and that Tim right there. Wow. There's another Alfred Bierstadt painting. Dogwood, 1875. Of course, a lot of dogwoods in Yosemite. Love the dogwoods there. Many of his paintings date back to the 1860s and 1870s. At the time, he looked like this. He died in 1902 at the age of 72 and is buried in a simple grave in the Rural Cemetery of New Bedford, Massachusetts. Now, in this museum, they also have a Holt Caterpillar tractor. As you know, Mr. Holt was from Stockton. We visited his grave at the Stockton Rural Cemetery, but he's the one that uh, basically invented this for farmers, and it led to the invention of the tank that we use in World War I. Crazy history. Here's a combine next to it. It's pretty cool. Here's a little bit more about that tractor, developed and patented by Benjamin Holt, 1904 here in Stockton, California. And look at this, a picture of him with the first tank. Oh my gosh, that's Mr. Holt right there. There's a military official saluting him. Check out that tank, gee whiz. I am so glad I stopped by the Hagen Museum. Uh, the gentleman opened the door for me, knows this channel, and he told me something interesting. Now, I need to let you know something. Faces of the Forgotten did a video here on Emma Ledoux and uh, did it a couple of months ago. And I saw that he was here and I thought, I can't believe it because I've been working on this story, this video for a long time. And so I don't want any of you thinking that I did Emma Ledoux because of him. But when he was here, the docent told me that he mentioned my channel. And the Faces of Forgotten Guy said, don't tell him I was here. He said, so I know that he watches your channel. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> I have come over to the Stockton Rural Cemetery to pay tribute to the gentleman that buried behind me, Walter Sibley. He was the San Joaquin County Sheriff at the time of Emma Ledoux's crime in 1906. I'm not to suggest that anybody was cursed in this story. However, I think Emma Ledoux had a lot more victims than she, than we probably know about. A lot of, maybe some of the husbands that died, and even some family members that she may have had a hand in poisoning. Uh, it just seemed like her habit in life was to find gullible men and then take advantage of them wherever she could. Now, she also ran a Lonely Hearts Club after she was released from, from prison, finally. And uh, she swindled all these guys out of their money. Not to suggest that this gentleman was cursed, but let me explain something. He had custody of Emma at the Stockton Jail from 1906 to 1910 when she was released. And uh, the following year, 
on his, I believe his fourth or fifth term as sheriff, he suddenly gets Bright's disease and he dies six months into his illness. His wife, Clara, is also buried here. 1911, <laughs> a year after Emma Ledoux was released from his jail. Sibley, 1858 to 1911, and his wife, you can see she lived another 38 years beyond what he did. It was in the 1898 election for sheriff that he was voted into office on the day that he took office, which was January 1st, 1899. His predecessor, Sheriff Cunningham, offered him some words of wisdom on handing over his pistol and his handcuffs. This is what he told him. I've never had any use for it. It is only to be used when your life is in danger or when you are positive that a prisoner who has committed a felony is trying to escape. Sheriff Sibley was on his fourth term as sheriff when he became ill with Bright's disease, which is a fatal type of kidney disease and nephritis. He died on June 4th, 1911, while in Berkeley. He'd been ill for six months before he died, and he left his wife an estate worth about $45,000, which was a lot of money back then. Most of his fortune was tied up in land in their home, which was located at 144 East Willow Street in Stockton which is the corner of Willow and Hunter Streets. If you look around at his neighbors, you can see that that same style, that same font, that same raised lettering on granite has been used here on the Sibley grave. So I'm gonna close out this video and just uh, comment a little bit about Emma Ledoux. She's a tragic figure, I think. Tragic in the sense that um, she didn't have to live a life the way she did. She was a fairly attractive woman and she didn't need to do the things that she did in her life, but she did. Now, this video, I'm not going to be visiting her grave. She died on July 6, 1941. She's buried at the Union Cemetery in Bakersfield, and it's quite a distance for me to drive. But other than that, there's nothing to show you. She's in an unmarked grave. I'm also not going to visit Albert McVicker's grave because he is in the Highland Cemetery in Wichita, Kansas, where his folks are. I bet people that visit that grave have no idea his history to one of the worst crimes in California. I don't know, it's, it's a very tragic story. Uh, I, th I was talking to the docent at the museum about Mr. McVicker, the thing. He was such a young man, and he died for what? For some adulterous woman who was also a bigamist, who liked a lot of men and liked to take advantage of men. It's really tragic. We'd love it if you could give us a comment. Uh, also, give us a thumb up, thumbs up on the way out and subscribe to History Hunters. We always appreciate having more people come into this channel's family. Thank you so much.